So um, I'm going to make a talk about uh, utilizing open source medical record system uh, to reach the next 33 million people. My name is Judith, and um, let's add it, my Twitter handle there. That's the easiest way um, to get a hold of me. And um, I'm actually from Kenya. It's a country on the eastern side of Africa. So, a little bit about me, um, I'm a radiology resident at Indiana University, and uh, I thought that's the best, the easiest way to describe uh, how I spent my time uh, doing. And, uh, so, apart from that, um, also um, entrepreneur, uh, we have a consulting company that we named SoftDrew that um, is really just works on deploying medical record system in the West African region and um, helping um, new implementers with their user needs and requirements gathering and consulting for global health projects, especially uh, mobile health. So my, my talk was titled The Next 33 Million. I borrowed actually this talk from a report that was done uh, by the Capital Markets um, Authority in Kenya. Uh, this was done in uh, 2012, and just sort of uh, reevaluated the business case for uh, healthcare expenditure in the country. And specifically, the, uh, the last census said that uh, there are 40 million, approximately 40 million Kenyans, and 33 million. Um, most of these people are starting to uh, increasingly spend their income in trying to acquire, like, get health services and. Um, out of those 40 million, 33 million can lack even basic insurance and get their healthcare uh, services from very broken systems. And so uh, their focus was to start to look at what would it take to capture the next 33 million um, tenants. So I take this, um, I went to medical school in Kenya and uh, this is the Kenyan AIDS, um, National AIDS Control Program. By when, um, uh, HIV AIDS was declared an epidemic. Uh, there were these many vans that were deployed to most of the rural facilities. And unfortunately, this is not an uncommon picture. You find that they're broken in the background. And so it just shows, of course, that cars do end up uh, getting destroyed. But mainly that, um, that most of the systems that we work in are fragile and easily, you know, do not have enough strength to withhold uh, the next pressure. This is one very common photo if you follow the global health uh, projects. And it's actually one of, well, when I was a young uh, medical student, um, this really uh, very nice gentleman came from the US, was looking for, uh, was doing some missionary work a little bit, and they ended up in Eldoret. And that time when I was a first year, one of the older students had contracted HIV AIDS and was home. But the classes were very, very small, and um, so people sort of knew each other, knew where they came from. And so when he didn't show up for uh, school one semester, a few students went back to his village and found that he had full-blown HIV AIDS. And so among, he was among the first 12 people that um, what was happening in the US at that point was he had gone to a clinic and um, had side effects, maybe like a rash or liver problems. Your ARVs were withdrawn. The ARVs are just the medications for HIV. They are withdrawn from you, but they are not expired. But they, they can't be issued to someone else. And so those were the really the very first drugs um, that Dr. Joe Mamlin brought uh, back to Kenya. And these were some of the earliest patients that benefited from uh, just that uh, vision. And so, uh, luckily, after. After he came back and you know he started getting more people um, getting to know the cause, he still lives there and um, I, I work with him throughout the medical school. But I think I'll explain to you later on that uh, at one point, I don't think I can tell this story as great as it is, but um, at one point his son, who's also a physician, uh, had come to visit him in Western Kenya and uh, started seeing how it was difficult to keep all the medical records on an Excel uh, system, trying to track who's gotten medication, who's died, who's lost to follow up. 
And uh, subsequently, this has evolved to be one of the largest HIV treatment centers in the world uh, in Western Kenya called Hampa. And I'll talk to you a little bit of how that fits into the bigger picture. So, like I said, my 33 million uh, talk was that more Kenyans are spending not dollars, but Kenyan shillings on healthcare, and uh, they lack basic in insurance and are treated in ill-equipped and um, poorly staffed facilities. And um, the private expenditure actually from this report was that approximately um, 3.1 billion dollars will be spent by Kenyans who are paying out of pocket uh, by 2025, which is like 11 years from now. So they were just making a case for what what would be the um, like the low hanging fruits for investment. And so every time I'm flying uh, back home, there's, you know, the HSBC, they have like these big uh, adverts in the, in the, like the tunnel as you put the plane. And I, I find it always very interesting to read like in their future adverts. And according to this report, so in the future, uh, which essentially just the next uh, 15 years, there will be the rise of market-based healthcare solutions, especially around um, the emerging markets. And private health insurance will become a big uh, component of healthcare delivery. And so if people are paying for it, then you have to link up with um, quality. And so there will be a higher need for higher quality of patient clinics and just um, improve care. And so. Uh, maybe it's a little bit of a bias from my medical background. Um, I, I think in the information systems, having a work in both Kenya and the American system, uh, that information really is care. And uh, this, this is not an uncommon uh, scene when I was a medical student. Two or three patients sharing a bed. You have these um, files of, of paper that you have to cram as, a, as the resident presenting that patient and your consultant gets very gross if you can't remember a lab from five days ago. So you end up doing a lot of busy work. And um, along this journey um, came, you know, uh, a lot of changes were going on in Kenya. People were reaching out, seeing that PIH also uh, at Harvard was also facing the similar problem. And so, uh, as especially people that cared for HIV started to realize that you know, we are having some common problems, and um, one of them is just information and what, how to better care for our patients. And so, uh, one of these um, sort of thought leaders came up with OpenMRS. OpenMRS is just an abbreviation for Open Source Medical Record System. I'll talk a little bit about it here. And um, so, these are really some of the founding fathers. And, well, it's simplistic that they actually just sat in like a cafe on paper napkins and started to drum up what it would take to start up um, an open medical record system. And so this has now grown um, in use of 42 countries. Our program um, in Kenya where um, I trained and worked for a little bit takes care of specifically 160,000 HIV patients. Uh, using uh, this system and now has moved to five uh, centers of excellence, one in cardiology, uh, obstetrician, obstetrics and maternal care, uh, diabetes and uh, hypertension and cancer to using the same system to uh, provide uh, health care. So a few instances also actually in the US. Most of the time uh, if you've sort of followed the health informatics pattern for the American states, is that you have these big siloed systems and they are really hard to work with. And um, so it's also interesting because uh, sometimes when you have some myths, uh, it's, it's synonymous that, you know, open source is poor and for developing countries, especially if you're talking about global health. And so uh, it's interesting to see that there, there has been some adoption actually in North America. And most of those actually do track um, like in Indianapolis, where um, which is closest to the medical school where I am, is uh, using it for the Indiana Health Information Exchange System to track notifiable conditions and uh, for the state, like tuberculosis, HIV, syphilis, and so they use the open source medical record system for the whole state. And um, so this 
Um, much as it looks pretty, it's just like one of the latest releases. It's free, you can like easily download it with the internet. Uh, one of the latest dashboards uh, for the reference application, which um, it's an interesting story because um, maybe seven years ago when I first downloaded OpenMRS, it took me two weeks to set it up. And um, now you can just set it up in like maybe 10 minutes. Okay. And so uh, one, one other thing that um, sort of uh, changed is this is one of the more um, releases that focuses on the user more than like the back end. And I'll talk to you like what, are, what has been our experiences about that. So I mean just in respect that because it's our main end platform, um, this is the mission for OpenMRS. And um, it emphasizes on um, coordinating a global community which uh, implements and creates um, open source medical record system. And like I emphasize, so the very first guys I, show, um, I showed you on the picture are actually doctors who are geeks. And so um, it sort of drives a little bit that care is still the first, like the focus. And um, I've at least worked with several record system with the CDC, at least um, in Africa. And most of the time it's because you're doing a study want your data to be good and so you you just ram up a, an operating system and use it and then once that's done you move on okay and because you come with the money if i tell you you know if if you have to earn a salary you have to enter a hundred patients then you don't have really much of a choice because you know um, and so uh, one of the things that this has happened is um, it focuses on on patients and one of the big engineers is actually a lead engineer for a homegrown medical record system in the, here in Indianapolis at the State Hospital for Indiana called Escanazi now. And it's, it's not fully open source, but they have opened on some, some of their things, and, um, which is big, I think, for the health informatics community for America because that doesn't happen. And um, so he also engineers the same sort of progress and like the data models were borrowed from each other. Uh, one interesting feature like a chart search which is basically you, if you're curious did this patient ever had an MRI you can just chart, search for it like Google and it pulls up was also it's, so, it's also shared like within between the open source and like the homegrown uh, medical record system. So our focus and uh, specifically targeting to work with um, to provide care it's building, it's emphasized on building with others. And we are lucky because um, when, when I started working with open source and open MRS, which was really my first experience for open source, I didn't know about GitHub. I, I mean, it was very, it's, it still is very Java, very heavy Java, which I disagree with by the way. But, <laughs> <laughs> so, but um, um, and what what lack was the community, but I can see over the years. <coughs> excuse me. I can see over the years uh, what's grown really is the community that I can get quickly on IRC, you know the IFC channel and ask a question to someone and you know get a response immediately. Um, the energy that you experience every time you go for the annual uh, meetings and uh, talk to people and go to visit their sites and see what they are doing. And then um, sort of having a user-driven uh, development strategy and also seeing the, the evolution of the tools that have been used to uh, continuously create this community of users. And I'll share like, our personal experience with that. So I know I'm saying in the future. But, um, so um, this is supposed to be like giving free, but being my first time in Portland, it's very free, so it's in line with the thing. <laughs> but, um, so, when, I think at this point, what I would like to emphasize is some of the myths that I've seen. Um, we've, we've tried not to build new, what we do is deploy, because uh, initially what, what people want is like, okay, and this is, comes with like the vendor systems, you get your software, they come install for you, and then they leave, okay? And people like it because if you're a doctor, you don't want to have to worry, maybe that LAN cable is not connected or something else, because it's not your job, okay? But um, what, what I noticed is in open source and this field for health and uh, healthcare delivery, number one, in the emerging markets, we do not know uh, 
like where to focus, and that's that's a fact. Like um, when I when I went through medical school in Kenya, I had never seen a patient die from a heart attack, and there are many Kenyans who die, but I had never seen, and that's that it would be inaccurate to assume that no one ever dies from a heart attack. Okay, and well, here in the U.S. Every day there is a cath lab activation, which is very dramatic, you know. And so it's we don't know what ails our uh, our population. Actually, one of the things that I emphasize on is just some work that we started to use the medical record system to try and answer some of those uh, questions, but focused on clinical care more than uh, research. And then, um, so when when people see uh, open source, they think it's free and easy. I don't think open source is free. Maybe you may not pay dollars for it, but there is, you you know, free means someone had to, there was an opportunity cost, you know. Maybe someone didn't watch a World Cup game trying to fix a bug, you know, or someone, um, hopefully they were, they were not stealing time from their family, you know, trying to fix an open MRS code. And um, so I think if you have to print open source, it can't be, um, that it's free in terms of free, like you won't spend money. And that's why um, if you're on the mailing list, you'll see someone writing an angry email, you know, I thought this was going to be the best thing, now I'm out of time, I'm frustrated, we've spent money, we can't move on, okay? And that's, that's just the wrong thing. So you should do all, the only thing with free is that you can contribute and give it back for free. That's sort of the mentality. And um, it's free because you can build a network of users. Now, specifically for like some of my experiences, number one has been um, so first fighting the myth that it's free because people will reach out to you and be like, oh, you have a good experience. You're thinking of setting up this uh, in this hospital. What do you think? And you tell them, okay, to do this, what are you trying to meet? And they'll say, well, we want to uh, register patients. Uh, we want to know. What was what uh, brought most patients to the hospital? How many died? What was their diagnosis, or something like that? And once that happens, you tell them. Now, as the platform is, maybe uh, I'll give you actually a practical example um, for some work that I'm helping on. Uh, it's an Ethiopian installation for a big hospital. Um, um, it's they have spent enough money on, the, on setting up the infrastructure. They just need something uh, to get started. And um, currently, the open MRS system would record patients as having a first name, middle name, and last name, okay? And that's how we've known it, right? But in Ethiopia, that doesn't happen because people get a first name, a father's name, and a grandfather's name, okay? So that already cannot be free. You can't just get it out of the box and, you know, take it to the field and say, okay, this is free. Then uh, their calendars, so people may present to hospital and say, I'm 58 years, but it's based on the Ethiopian calendar, which in our system we use the Gregorian cal calendar, like the English calendar. So even if it's free, it can't really be free because you need to capture that data, and if you're gonna utilize like some of the reporting tools, you need to have to convert it back to Gregorian, but display to the end user as what they you, you know what they know, right? And so um, one other thing is that um, watching, like looking through the mailing list, uh, there is, so one big thing, thanks to Michael here, is the community, and uh, Michael coordinates the community of OpenMRS, provides to. But what I realized is that um, people get um, community fatigue, okay? So no one wants to answer the same question every day <laughs> for one year, okay? No, nobody wants to do that. And so, uh, so I've seen that, you know, even if we don't appreciate them, but we don't realize how much work they do so that you're not getting 50 emails from one, you know, one open source project and 50 emails from another, is that uh, at the back end, they find tools to make us effective, okay? So that if we want to, ca to capture like um, common needs for users, we can vote for them, okay? If, if you think this is important, vote for it, we'll work on it. Okay, if uh, you want not to uh, to burden everyone with your emails, first of all, I, I have noticed a trend that if you ask those common emails, no one will respond to you. Okay, and 
so you can create a good Q and A, okay, and give points for people who ask questions and those who answer the questions, okay. And so all you have to uh, do is set up your own standard for starting up with open source, like. You know, Google is your best friend, okay? First ask Google and then ask our forum and, and then move on to the IRC and something else. And so you'll find that people will log, um, just something simple like logging all the conversations in IRC, in the mailing list, and making them searchable, reduces the number of, you know, similar questions asked every time, okay? And once, and of course, I think documentation is a big problem for everyone, that's still our in progress, I would say. <laughs> But, um, so, specifically for my work and from the business, this was supposed to be like a business uh, thing. So, one of the things that we work on is actually linkage and retention. And for me, I feel that, that that's the low-hanging fruit if we were going to provide uh, care to the next 33 million Kenyans. And linkage and retention starts from diagnosis, and once you start to treat them, that you can quickly, uh, you, you don't lose touch um, with those patients. And so most of the other countries what they're starting to do is that, um, because the doctors are few and the nurses are mostly working in the hospital, is to move back to the communities and start to form like community units and community hubs for healthcare. And these hubs uh, end up having a community extension worker. Now the challenge is that this, I mean, honestly, Everyone in this room, how long do you think it will take for you to learn how to record a weight? Maybe one minute, right? You can take someone's weight, right? Just ask them to step on the scale <laughs> and read, you know, and enter it somewhere. And so, one of the things is that um, these community health extension workers, some of them are not medical professionals, but they can go to the hospital, to the homes, and ask. Is your child coughing? What was their last weight? Are they having diarrhea? Are they having vomiting? And then they're supervised. And maybe it's not very different because I know that global health pro products are marketed like for developing countries. It's not very different to what's happening in the US, and especially with the uh, physician assistants, where it's cheaper to hire many physician assistants than more than physician. And you get one physician that you pay extremely well, okay? and have all this assistance under him. And the thing with that is actually you cannot sue the physician assistant. Mm -hmm. So even the litigation cost, you know, is just on one person, okay? And so it's the same model. You're having these community hubs of people that come to these communities and have a supervisor, maybe like a nurse, and then setting up referral systems to specialized care. So at this point, you can make interventions for malnutrition, follow up on vaccinations, clean water, education, which are things that would not uh, most likely happen in the hospitals, okay? So specifically for this uh, linkage and retention, what we are doing is just identifying people correctly. Now that may be a trivial problem here, but the very first time uh, I, I needed, actually uh, one year ago, when I, I applied for residency, and I said that, you know, I wrote my names, and the school uh, sent me more paperwork, obviously, and I filled in my names. And this person asked, are you sure you're a resident? Because just because I used my middle name and my last name, and they thought these were two completely different people. Now, in these places where we work, uh, I mean, the way you describe, even when, you, when you're giving someone like directions to your home, you'll tell them, you know, just go, when you get to this tree, because there's a big tree that's known by everyone, and the river, and how many you know hills you cross, it's just really hard to capture those uh, that sort of data in a medical record system. So duplicate patients means um, if if you miss, let's say this person was registered on day one as a Judy who's HIV negative, but the next time um, was Judy who's HIV positive. Okay, that has a big implication on delivery of care. Okay, so we, no one wants to work on the dirty things, and patient matching is really one of those things. You know, it's messy. It's you don't get rewarded. You know, <laughs> I mean, who cares? As long as you know, it's not a beautiful UI. And um, so lack of addresses. People do not know their exact uh, dates of birth. We don't have a national uh, unique identifier, and in. In various communities, Kenya has 42 communities, we share names. 
and every community has their own patterns of naming. So one community names people based on the seasons they were born, and if they were born at night or in the day. Okay. In my community, we inherit names. So I'll share someone's name, and I pick my dad's name, and maybe um, in future I can change it to my husband's name or something like that. And other communities. So and then now, over the last two years, when I look at maybe all my friends on Facebook now who have uh, babies, they are changing even the names more because now you're picking your dad's name but adding a uh, junior. Okay. So you may have uh, Kevin Okello, who's the father, who also inherited his grandfather's name, who probably is alive, and his father shares one of those names. And so th these people live in homestead. So it's the same. Um, <coughs> Latitude and longitude, if you're using GPS system. And their son now, whom they name the exact thing, but just add a junior. Okay? So, naming patterns are a nightmare. It's, <coughs> it's dirty work. And so, one of the things we are working with is the use of biometrics for patient identification. And because, so, Try and imagine, I said that you have these community extension workers in the field, and so these people cannot be carrying laptops with places without electricity, okay? So you, we are giving them mobile phones and trying to integrate a biometric identification system on the mobile phone. So that way we can correctly identify them in the field, have them continuously use basic clinical physician support tools to capture data in the field, and then uh, that data comes back to our system, we analyze it and then parameterize the intervention. Okay? So this is more of like a general thing, but it's not targeted. And like I said, no one wants to do uh, patient matching. And so based even like on the phonetic names and the name swapping, we're starting to build algorithms. Um, actually, we're just start testing one on how to properly identify patients. Okay. And so one other thing um, that we are working on is actually uh, something we're calling the data migrant. So, like I said, those for, for the AMPAT system, where we have those Excel uh, projects and a lot of paper. I mean, this is, this is very usual in, in any hospital in Kenya, these many, many records of, over the years. And um, so what, what you're working on is digitization of the records. And initially, when we started out this, what we were doing is, um, I don't know if you've heard of a solution called Captricity. So it's, I think, they did some work for the FDA, but really it's, um, they built some algorithms, just, you know, computer vision algorithms, where they realign the paper and are able to shred the data into small pieces. Then this data is analyzed by this group of micro -workers. I think most of the work is done in India. Okay, so you have these people that are confirming that, yeah, that's a one, you know, the computer read it as a one, this is two, this is three, this is four, and um, that data is then reassembled back and you can get it as a CSV file. But, so there are two levels of complexity. First of all, there, there, there is a group of data that, ha that, that is really uh, just in paper, and that's a big chunk of data, but there are other, these small, small systems, and so, like for Kenya, what happened, uh, we had standards developed and, um, for EMR implementation, and now Kenya has adopted Spoken MRS as a national like EMR for implementation in the ambulatory care clinics. Okay? And that's happened, Tanzania has done the same, Rwanda has done the same, and um, uh, Bangladesh. Right? And so, we are having these countries come up and say, okay, we don't want all these small scale systems that are all over the place, we just want uh, we want you to migrate to the bigger system. And that's because, it's not because it's free, it's because it's easy to make a community of experts and users around one system, you know? And um, so we have uh, many access and access uh, systems that you're trying to migrate into open MRS. But these systems initially were not done uh, with any standards, okay? So, and that may be trivial, but standard is really the medical language of professionals. So how do I know that maybe Dr. X, who said that this patient had a cough for five days, okay, meant five days. Uh, you know, when you compare to Dr. X, who said this patient had a cough, okay?
okay? A call for five days and a call for 14 days and a call for one month completely mean different things in medicine, okay? And so, uh, standardizing what is on those legacy systems based on a concept dictionary and then migrating and giving data quality tools is really one of the projects you're working with, with um, one of the national implementers in Kenya. Now, the big challenge is we did a pilot for for, from the paper migration system. And so uh, I didn't copy some of the findings that we had um, on this slide, but we find that what's been happening in the clinics when you go there is that they have this, like, you know, the cleaners, because you clean in the morning and then you're idle in the afternoon, right? So, you know, you give them this card and tell them, enter this record. So now these records have maybe TDF, E, e, F, e, F, Z, they kind of make sense of what, you know, what's this, okay? So, uh, it's sort of like um, mining that data, but also making sense of the data before it's migrated to the record system. And also, sometimes it's just that there's no need to migrate if the data is too dirty. If it can't be seen, it can't be seen, okay? So, um, this paper portion is still a work in progress. Uh, the complexity solution was actually really good, but just too expensive. That was the only thing. It works, but it's just too expensive. So um, I think maybe just to give ourselves some time for people to ask questions and share their experiences. Um, so even if it, you know, like uh, it's open source, it's not synonymous to free, you know, like in terms of dollars. Just remember, there's an opportunity cost and. Um, it just maybe means it's freely available and you can give back, okay? And then, you know, like, um, I can give like a one minute talk of how we found ways to monetize. And then, um, the big thing is reuse, don't invent, but you can only do this if you keep asking those questions and always assuming that someone else has done what you're trying to do. That means you go out and read and read and search and maybe improve on it or well, if you want to build it, I think you can. And then um, standards, I say, like for healthcare, if you're gonna reach um, the system that you're delivering to, you must have standards so that you know, uh, if you're saying that this patient has tuberculosis, it's based on this criteria, and that's exactly the same. And that way, you can build clinical decision support among those uh, things. And so the big thing is actually avoid emerging needs. I'm sure we all know about this. Uh, a few years ago, when a really novel thing for community pharmacies came up, and Kenya, of, of course, adopted it, and um, they went to the um, Northeastern Kenya, which is really on the border of Somalia, and that's a nomadic community, and set up this really beautiful pharmacy. And no one was using them, and so they held these community meetings and asked, you know, why aren't you using this um, pharmacy? And they said, we did, a, we did not need a pharmacy for human beings. We thought you were bringing a pharmacy for animals who are always dying all the time. And so that's, you know, and, and it's bad. It's a lot of money, but you can always imagine what, what you think people need. But if you're not working with them and sort of seeing the, the challenges, then it's just really hard to um, implement any system. And so most of, um, just because people will have different needs and we work a little bit more uh, from the clinical angle. We found it easier to connect to physicians that are running programs because then we can speak the language of physicians and honestly they don't want to spend time trying to tell you, oh, they, you know, there are four different types of notes. One is for the staff, one for the resident, one for the medical student because those may not be like so automatic for programmers. And so that's one of the things we found a way to monetize, just to act in as a bridge between uh, the open source and the implementer. And then one, you know, talking about uh, some of the actual challenges, really, by the way, is one uh, about licensing. And I think that will be something, I hope maybe next year or the next two years, we'll start to see people talk about. And because this program is, uh, program is contributed to by, um, you know, thousands of users who live in different places. So if you decide to monetize, you know, like in the real spirit of open source, you know, do you give back the code uh, that you develop? Or, because you do make, um, especially if you're selling uh, like the code and everything else, you do make money from, from the effort of so many users, you know? And it's gonna be interesting to see what people think about 
uh, future like trends for monetization because people are starting to notice those things and um, sort of make uh, some pieces like closed source but this platform that is not very helpful as open source so that you always end up like required to buy a um, home. So the other real challenge you faced is developers and um, I started developing uh, many years ago and every year I promised myself that this is the last year and I'm gonna step away and it doesn't work <laughs> because um, unfortunately I actually did start developing in, uh, in Java. The reality <laughs> is it's, it's very um, human capital and time in terms, you know. And the way I describe this is maybe on a long day after call, I just want to come home as I watch maybe a soccer game. Can I write some code really fast? And that's not Java. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, and, and I don't mean to offend anyone, but that's <laughs> so uh, when you when you go back to like Kenya, it's really hard to get excellent Java teachers. So those excellent Java programmers will never work for you. They work for other big companies, okay? And they are stretched thin and they can't just work for you. So one of the things is that we've started to modify, and this is also an exciting time because also OpenMRS is sort of moving towards that, especially the front end, is that we've started to move to maybe like AngularJS, which is really fast. As long as you know what you're doing, I mean, you can spin things pretty fast. Um, um, like for data, like, because ultimately all these things are focused on one thing, that our business will be data. You know, having all this information from all these implementations, and we can say, yeah, most Kenyans who come to hospital, you know, these hospitals charge this amount of money. The insurance don't know how much to charge in Kenya because no one is using standards, and you don't know how to build. So we'll be sort of providing that information. That's sort of like our bigger picture, and that's why we are doing like the messy work of patient registration, you know, sort of data migration, sort of to set up um, such a model. Thank you. Oh, yeah, yeah. So um, the open source medical record system is not is beyond that because I I was among like the very first uh, people that started working on it. Now we just adopted it for our use. Most of the stuff that we work on still like the patient matching comes back to open source medical record system. It's actually used in two countries. If you just go, I have some pamphlets for people who. Um, you can just go online and just download it and run it and just see. So, um, for anyone that's interested, so um, so it's actually news. It's just more of our experience. So, the open open MRS for us is just a platform. You know, like whatever I'm telling you, like oh, you want to link and retain um, patients, you have to do the work. This is just more of like, hey, this is the farm, here is the, you know, spade and all the folks that you need, you go here to work and get some um, props for us. And so that's more of the work that we're doing. We're using this platform to drive a little bit of some innovation. The data migration tool we built, actually, uh, we built it in Python. You said the, uh, when you were using consensus or whatever it is, it was too expensive. Are you yeah. working on alternatives? Yeah, okay. actually, if, if you have some ideas, you'd be interested to hear about those. And so one thing that happened um, over the last three years is the Kenyan government changed the constitution. And now we have counties, which essentially are states. And so what one of the things, because it's the same problem, the, the paper problem is not a health problem. It's, it's a developing country's problem. Everything is in paper. And for those systems to be effective, uh, we'll see a big move for people to digitize that data, okay? And make it even just such a goal. You know, even, you could even, there are many forms of digitization. You could say that uh, people go through these papers, give like their key search terms, build a big metadata, scan the document and append them to that metadata and have, allow people to quickly search for that data. Or you can try and extract what's considered important from that data or how of it. 
And so one of the models that we're starting to work with in the community actually as a joint venture with another company in Kenya is um, to, to work with young people that have no jobs to become our micro workers in Kenya in these like, state hubs, okay, and sort of digitize the data for their local county, you know, so that you have this regional records of very good paper records. How do you ensure like patient confidentiality? Do you have encryption? So the the open source system already has like its own uh, security standard, and there is even a, like a security team because it's using like real patient uh, care delivery. So in Kenya, if you're talking about patient care, you can't host the servers outside geographically out of Kenya. So like the big upper program hosts within the facility, like they have a data center, and. Um, so encryption and just in, so because the center now has almost 78 other peripheral centers providing care for patients, we've set up our own wide area network because connectivity is a problem. And so it's like a secure VPN for just uh, patient transfer of data. For the digitization, once uh, like the capacity system, if you want to check it out, it um, you. Once you shred the data, I mean, if you see Judy, because data can only make sense if you know the context of the information. So if you see CD4 count, you see like a, a million CD4 counts, you cannot correlate that that belongs to me, as long as you're seeing like the small pieces. It's, it's like you shredding your paper and then <coughs> giving someone every small piece of paper and then using from the back end to join those. But the medical records, and that's the advantage of working with communities, that's been our biggest uh, support. It's that you have these people, and like the community decides that. Um, so, like I, I think the big focus of this year is order entry, which is uh, very different because that means you can integrate with other lab information system, you can integrate with radiology system. You know, just based on order entry, you can build based on the orders that people get and the data that comes in. So the community decided that this was the year to focus on order entry. And one of the other things is that people started to see we are working in many, many centers. So we don't want to deploy one system in all of those. And so two sort of like initiatives that have come out of this um, medical record system is the uh, OPEC Health Information Exchange, which is actually been first uh, installed in Rwanda. That is many open MRS uh, instances that send data back to a whole open health information exchange system. I wanted to ask about, uh, since it's in 32 countries, 42. 42? Mm -hmm. uh, what's like the localization difficulty with that uh, like, translation and uh, mm -hmm. all of that kind of stuff? So one thing that has really come up is local user groups. So like uh, Mozambique, we have a Portuguese user, user group. So, and uh, I think one year ago, one of the Google some of those students did a localization app. So all you need to do is run the module, uh, you, you know, your front-facing things, like in one day, translate what you want, and it saves it on your back end, and you have your own localized instance. So the bigger thing is concept dictionary. Like, you know, cough cannot be coffee, because I'm big, I'm sure. And so most of those local uh, instances work with, um, the Millennium Villages that sort of is the father of, you know, like the custodian of the dictionary, to work with um, people that, you know, map concepts. So you can find cough, like in Kenya, in Swahili, and uh, English, and Kinyarwanda, and all other languages that are mapped to the same concept. But it has to be same thing, community of users that come together and do this. So one of the things that, I mean, for East Africa, it's OK, because we, we work in English. But uh, other places, um, Haiti, are um, deploying the same system for Miriabali Hospital, which is one of the new like referral hospitals being built after their disaster, and it's in French. So, yeah. Can I make a quick follow-up to uh, someone from Arabic background, right to left? So is that also like, because I noticed on the map that the Arab world was all missing. Mm -hmm. I haven't honestly seen an Arab instance um, there are some people exploring that, but I don't think we have anything in, in clinics yet. Uh, most of those the there might be, there might be uh, NGOs or other groups that 
they be working in English for some reason? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, well, I haven't seen honestly like that in, you know, pure open awareness uh, in Arabic. Um, I, I was just, my brother is living in Kenya and he was, oh. used to be in uh, like Kakamega. Uh -huh. And so I, I went and visited him in 2009 and they uh, they said, oh, you know computers, so uh, please come up. They, they went to the local hospital and they were having some, net. they had four PCs, just like no internet, but just connected between themselves for medical records. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, it was like, wow, you know, just like the experience of that. And when do they just, when is it better to bring medical records to, I mean, this is very rural, very rural farmland for me. And when is it better to bring, bring um, medical records there? Because, you know, power was very intermittent, right? I mean, like, you know, it, what, at some point, you, you know, you say, okay, we've got these medical records online, but if the power's out and I can't, you know, you know, use anything, then I've got no records, right? It's still better, it'd be better to have paper. So is there, is there a clear threshold at which you say, okay, there's enough Utility power reliable here that we should do it, or but we should but we should wait because it's better to have the records and to not have them. So uh, number one, that's like the reality of the ground. So one of the things we've done is also move a little bit more to mobile. It mm. works very well with mobile. Most people can charge their mobile and use it for the duration of the clinic. Okay, so that doesn't affect like you buffer yourself against uh, like power surging. Then, um, other, another thing actually I've seen is the Chromebooks. Mm -hmm. Those things keep a lot of battery power. Like, you can run them, as long as you can charge them once a day, they're gonna run your clinic, like, throughout the day. So, that's one of the things, because you cannot honestly tackle the power problem in Kenya. Unless, till the day there's competition. You know, I, I noticed the different turn at home, that every time my computer is connected, and when I'm here, I can, you know, work and remember, oh, my battery is going off and connect you. you the, the power problem is a big issue. So what we've done is mobile, like, tablets will give you a good, you know, up to six hours, seven hours of working. And Chromebooks, honestly, if you want from facing things, Chromebooks work amazing. You know? And some people, some of the hospitals have backup generators. And the challenge, actually, back home is, um, you know, some of the basic principles people don't really appreciate, like um, like concepts, just the medical language. Because you find people that have invested all this money to capture all this data, but it doesn't make sense. You know, uh, if you're, if you're going to say that this patient had cancer, what was your criteria for that cancer? Or oh, you forgot to collect the pathology data. So all that data is useless, you know? And so that's sort of what we've, learned, we've done is we have like a minimum data set, and that's what we work with with the data migration. Pick up what's recommended by the WHO or the government and say, hey, your data must at least capture these elements of your reporting and then move uh, from there. Yeah. Thank you, Thanks, guys. For Thank you. Guys.